Hi, everybody. Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fashion Bunker. The moment has finally arrived. We've been thinking that it would arrive sooner rather than later, given the age of Virginie Villard. But Virginie Villard is leaving Chanel. The official departure date has been announced today. Thank you, Chanel, for announcing it on the day of my live stream. So I get to break the news to everybody immediately. What perfect timing, Chanel. I wonder if Lena had anything to do with that. But I get to break this news to you because Chanel themselves contacted me to break the news to me. And up until this moment, I wasn't allowed to say anything. <laughs> Isn't that something? Yes. Chanel actually wrote me, and I was shook, shook. Here we are. Let's talk about it. First, subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Push the join button next to the subscription button. Become a member today. Get access to extra perks. You can also join me on Patreon. Super Deco Ball spelled together there as well for extra perks. This video is being filmed live in front of a live virtual audience. I live stream several times a week, so come join the fun, come join the chats, thumb up the video. Everything I say in this video is for entertainment purposes only, not rooted in truths or facts. Everything's alleged and just my opinion. I woke up, started getting ready for the live stream, and I get a message, and I faint. I cannot disclose from who. I can only tell you it's from Chanel. <laughs> and, and I'm like, I, I, I literally fall off my chair. I'm like, Virginie Villard departing Chanel? And I was like, okay, you know, we were speculating a couple of weeks ago on my channel here in the live stream. We were talking about Virginie and like, okay, you know, rumors. Will she be leaving? Is she good enough? Her latest cruise Marseille collection for Chanel was a travesty, allegedly, according to some of us. And I said, you know, maybe she wants to leave. I mean, she's in her 60s. She's been working her whole life. She has a kid. Like, maybe she just wants to chill. Like, she's been working a lot her whole life. This is Virginie, by the way. So maybe Virginie's just ready to, like, say, you know what, guys? We'll go, we'll go. Let me chill. You know, daddy chill. Daddy chill. And I was speculating, thinking to myself, if she were to leave Chanel, it would probably be because she wants to retire. Which, honestly... I would be fine with, uh, not, I'm not throwing shade here. I have grown to really appreciate Virginie at Chanel. I have grown to actually like not all of her collections, but quite a few of her collections I really did, did enjoy. Um, so much so that I've purchased several Pret-a-Porter pieces from Virginie's collections for myself, you know. Carl's pieces were very theatrical. Hers are wearable. <laughs> That's just what it is. Uh, Virginie Villard says that warms my heart in the chats. Uh, of course, we have uh, Virginie Villard, VR, virtual reality Virginie in the chats with us. Thank you so much, sweetie. So I am sad to see her go, believe it or not. Now, think about it this way. She has been the artistic director at Chanel since Carl passed away. Uh, and yes, we're also going to talk about who's going to come next after Virginie. So she has been the artistic director at Chanel for five years. Now, Chanel has expanded so much that they do 10 collections a year. Okay. Between the pre-spring summer, pre-fall winter, main spring summer, main fall winter, cruise collection, Metier da, Coco Neige, the, the, the snow collection, Coco by the beach, the Coco beach collection, haute couture winter, haute couture summer. This woman has done in five years, if we are to calculate 10 collections a year, she's done more or less 50 collections. That's five, zero, 50 not 15, 50, 50 collections, give or take a collection or two, 
in five years. That's a lot. That's a lot. Plus, yes, they've announced her departure. There's going to be the haute couture season coming up soon. So I'm thinking she's probably going to do the last haute couture show. Because you don't just, you know, it's not like she woke up yesterday and figured out, you know what, I'm, I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm not going to renew my contract. Ring, 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 calls Lena now here and say, hey, Lena, listen, listen, Lena. I'm done, girl. What will go, will go. We go. We go. <laughs> uh, this was in the making, this departure. So here's what I think. I believe they already have their new artistic director. And I believe that Virginie has already been working with the new artistic director to guide them into, you know, the world of Chanel. So the next haute couture show is either going to be her alone, bowing out, doing her last collection, making her last collection an haute couture collection, which would be dignified. In my opinion, it would be terrible if Virginie's last collection were to be the Marcel Cruz collection, because that's... That's the latest collection we have of hers before the announcement that she's departing. Could you imagine if her l last collection is the Marcel Cruz collection and like, we'll go, we'll go. What a sad way to go. What a sad way indeed to go. So I believe she's going to get the Haute Couture collection to say goodbye and to introduce the new person. This is what I think is going to happen. Also, Maybe the new person, the new artistic director, has been working with her already on the new uh, Haute Couture collection. Maybe not. But don't forget, all of these brands, including Chanel, you know, Chanel, who's doing 10 collections a year, they have to work like a year or two years ahead of time, right? So what does this mean? Technically, if Virginie is now announcing her departure, we're still going to see her collections for the next coming two years, <laughs> even though she's not there anymore, because she's already been working on collections coming up in the next two years, right? Or, or Chanel has already known since two years who's coming next, and that person has been secretly going to the ateliers and working on the collections that are going to come up in the next years. If that were the case, and if her departure was not like, surprise, surprise, I'm leaving, but if her departure was planned, and I do hope that her departure is only connected to her just wanting to chill and retire, I really hope that her departure is not connected to any diseases or anything like that. I hope that Virginie is healthy, and I hope that she has a wonderful, wonderful life, long life ahead of her, uh, in freedom and retirement with her family. You know, like, I hope it's not like a case like with Carl, that something is off. I hope that she's super healthy and that she's just done. She's worked a long time, right? But to rein it back into the CEO of Chanel, right, Lina Nair, and the other, uh, I wanted to say something, I'm not going to say, Bruno Pavlovsky. They've been lying to us, basically, right? Allegedly, because just a couple of weeks ago, right, there was an interview where Bruno spoke, Lina spoke, and they said, yeah, Virginie's doing a great job. Our 16% profit increases is also thanks to her because her fashion is selling very well. Like, we're giving her a heads up. She's amazed. Like, you know, like, they made it sound like she is going to stay there till her till she kicks the bucket, like Carl. But as it so often is in corporate lingo, the more the CEOs praise you publicly, and the PR-wise, they do that to protect their butts, the more, this is from personal experience, the more the CEOs praise you publicly, and the more you should be worried that it's game over for you. 
unfortunately, this is how it is. If somebody is good at their job at this level, they don't praise you. The press can praise you, but not the CEOs. The CEOs keep you in your place. You're good at your job. Keep doing what you're doing. There's no need to talk about you. When they have the need to talk about you, something's off. And the more Bruno Pavlovsky and the more Lina Nair praised Virginie Via, and the more I was thinking, oh, she's leaving. And I said that to you guys several times in the past live streams. And looky, looky where we are now. Indeed, she is leaving. Listen to Jacob. I know what I'm talking about. I've been working in the fashion industry for decades. This is how it goes. And another thing. Another thing I told you in the past few weeks and months as we were together analyzing all the interviews with Lina Nair, the interviews with Bruno Pavlovsky. Both Bruno and Lina keep repeating every time they're asked the question, are you, is Chanel going public? Are you going to sell the company? Are you going to go on the stock market? Because Chanel is a privately owned company still. Every time this question is thrown at Lina or Bruno, they are like that quick to say, no, 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 no. We're staying private. But the more they are quick to say, no, Chanel is staying private, and the more I believe Chanel is going public. Because again, corporate CEO lingo talk, they are going to tell you the opposite of what they mean, allegedly, of course. So I call on that BS. In fact, we just caught them in their lie. It's not like they said Virginie staying with us for an unlimited amount of time. They never said that. But if we read between the lines, the implication, what they were implying, Lena and um, Bruno, was that Virginie is doing a great job. Of course, she should, you know, like they were implying she's staying when I believe they already knew that she was leaving, but they were just giving that poker face to maintain stability with Chanel's earnings, with the profits, because once the news hits that the artistic director is leaving, it's quite disruptive. Sales might plummet. If the designer is very popular and famous, and let's say, unfortunately, the designer passes away, then the sales skyrocket because everybody wants to buy a piece of the last collection of that designer. But this is thankfully not the case with Virginie. She's, you know, hopefully doing well and she's alive, thankfully. So it's not like we are now all running to buy something from Chanel from her last collection ever. No, because there's still going to be a cruise collection from Marseille and possibly uh, there's also going to be, well, there's also going to be the winter collection, and there's also going to be an haute couture collection if you can afford <laughs> the haute couture collection. But another thing that I found very interesting uh, in this period of the announcement of Virginie's departure is how, for the first time ever, Chanel has played a new launch of a new product in such a weird teasing way as if they were trying to distract us from what was really going on. And this is something that big corporations love to do. It's a PR move, very strategic marketing move. And uh, the, the said launch is this. How interesting that what Chanel is claiming resembles a drop of perfume for their brand new launch of Chanel Number no. 5 Low, the Pebble Bottle, how this kind of turns out to be a teardrop. Virginie's teardrop. There you go. It's a little teardrop. Bloop. This launch is very, very, very interesting. It's an interesting distraction because they are teasing it in such a weird way. 
they showed only one corner of the bottle first, saying like, you don't know what's coming, something is coming, something is coming. Then they're referencing Marilyn Monroe and the past, and they're referencing a revolution, something brand new for Chanel. Then they send out emails. I got an email. Chanel telling me, hey, you are a very valued customer. Uh, we're going to have a special exhibition to showcase the evolution of Chanel number no. five. Would you like to join? We're going to have the pre-launch of the product. Here's a special link for you. You can purchase the perfume before anybody else. Here's a special invite to the boutique. There's going to be a launch party. Everything is great with us. We are doing so good. Price increases coming up at the beginning of next year as well. It's like very, very much hype around a bottle. I'm like, why are they hyping this so much? I mean, it's, yeah, it's a wonderful bottle. I love it. I bought it. Hashtag not sponsored. I bought it with my own money. But I'm thinking, you know, when they launched the red Chanel number no. five bottle, they didn't create such a weird hype of secrecy of like, you're a VIP client. You're invited to a special pre-launch. You're invited to the exhibition. You're invited to the party. You cannot purchase it yet. Only the beauty boutiques get the bottle first. Then the other, like, it's very... It distracted me a lot. It made me focus on this and it created a weird FOMO and they keep repeating, it's a very limited edition. Not everybody can have access to it. I don't believe this because quite frankly, if they're gonna invest in new tooling for a new bottle, you know that they made a ton of these. Sure, I believe it's a limited edition, but I don't believe these are gonna sell out in one minute. I believe they're gonna be around for at least a month or two. But the hype around this bottle launch in the same time when they are announcing the departure of Virginie VR, very sus. I have a feeling that this little launch played into distracting us from what's going on at Chanel. But thankfully, we got Super Dacum here. I'll see through the smoke and the mirrors. Let me tell you, honey. But now after all is said and done, Virginie is leaving. Now it's official. And we do have several news. Vogue business actually also reported about it. And Vogue Business on their Instagram writes, Chanel official confirms the departure of Virginie Villar. You see how they say that? They confirm the departure of Virginie Villar. They are not saying if they let her go, fired her, or if she quit. They're keeping it very vague on purpose. After a rich collaboration of five years as artistic director of fashion collections, during which she was able to renew the codes of the house while respecting the creative heritage of Chanel. How basic and minimal <laughs> and to the point? Yes, I agree. It's like, it's like I wrote it. She did respect the heritage of Coco more than Carl. She really respected Coco Chanel's DNA and design most of the time, more than, than, than Carl did. She did her job. Um, she did not have an ego. She was not like Carl. She was not jumping into the press, giving interviews, making it all about her. I very much respect that about Virginie Villar, that she was so elegantly in the background, even though she was the boss the artistic director of Chanel. Uh, she did not need the star allure. She was very, very, very much uh, humble and modest about this, which is a very Coco thing to do, actually. So in that respect, she was perfect for Chanel, believe it or not. So they say artistic director of fashion collections during which she was able to renew the codes of the house while respecting the creative heritage of Chanel. And almost 30 years within the house, because she was working as a first assistant to Karl Lagerfeld as well, from the 80s onwards, a new creative organization will be announced in due course. Now, this last sentence got me. A new creative organization will be announced in due course. They did not say that a new artistic director will be announced. No. 
And again, we're back to Chanel Beauty as an indicator of something. Who left Chanel very hush-hush during the pandemic? Lucia Pica. Lucia Pica was artistic director of Chanel Beauty makeup. She was obsessed with the color red. They didn't mention anything. She was let go. She just disappeared. And then for a transitional period of time, about a year or two, internally, Chanel, Chanel's team of makeup development was designing the makeup. There was no artistic director until this year, they launch the Perfume Comate to celebrate not just Chanel's 1932 Platinum and Diamonds collection of jewelry, right? Blah, 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 Comate associated with that. No, also to celebrate something else. The Comate Collective, the collective Comet trio of three ladies that have been hired as a group to together artistically direct Chanel Beauty. And they officially started launching their group Comet Collective collections just this year. Interesting how this year is also the year in which Virginie is leaving. Comet is launched, literally the launch of a comet. And now Chanel is telling us a new creative organization will be announced in due course. So I'm thinking, of course, we have all been speculating for years now who is going to, even before Carl was gone, we were thinking, who's going to come after Carl? Who's going to come to Chanel after Carl? But now, right, we were thinking who's going to come after Virginie Via. And now we're going to talk about who I think might come to Virginie Via, uh, after Virginie Via. But before we say that, I want to say there is a possibility that Chanel is really restructuring and reorganizing even their fashion to be led by a team of creative minds and not just one person. And I would find that highly interesting because nobody else is really doing it. I mean, some are a little bit. LVMH is kind of doing it by giving one designer the female collection, another designer the male collection, designer. Um, they're giving a musician the male collection. They're giving a designer the female collection. That's on them for hiring a musician, a producer of music. Uh, anyway, that's a whole other can of worms. But when it comes to Chanel, I think there's a possibility that they might follow the lead on what, for example, Gucci did uh, when they hired Alessandro Michele. Alessandro Michele was already within Gucci, but underneath the ranks, right? And then they kind of elevated him to the top and he became artistic director and it really worked for Gucci. There might be somebody else behind the scenes at Chanel or a group of people that are being brought up to work together or Chanel is still counting on Depends on if they're really deciding to sell the company or not, and or, and slash or, if they're still deciding whether or not they want the company to go public. They might be still thinking of playing the card of Karl Lagerfeld, the card of a star designer to lead the brand forward. We have issues here. First of all, Chanel's prices are insane. Do you want people to still keep spending exorbitant amount of money for stuff that isn't worth that money? If you want to do so, how do you go about it? How do you make people desire the pieces enough to warrant them purchasing said overly priced pieces? Well, Star designer might help because a lot of people fall for that. If there's a star designer for them, it's like an extra guarantee of excellence. So Carl was a star designer at Chanel, but Chanel went a different route when they hired Virginie. They completely stopped with the star and they went with somebody relatively unknown, right? I mean, within the fashion business, people knew her, but she was not a star. 
like Carl was. Now they might, now they tried the route of the non-star. Now maybe they want to go back to the star system. I believe the time of the musical chairs at the fashion helm, at the helm of fashion brands, luxury fashion brands, is over. Uh, it's really tired. I don't even know anymore what designer is at what house. It's become that ridiculous. They have been twisting and turning their positions and jobs so quickly you don't even know anymore who is doing who. You know, you say Daniel Lee. I'm like, oh, yeah, Bottega Veneta. No, no, he's at Burberry doing a terrible job, allegedly, at it. But it's like, oh, wait, so uh, Kim Jones. Yeah, D Dior. Wait, no, no, Fendi. <laughs> well, but also Dior. Or does he do both? Like, wait, who's doing who? Um, it, it, it's a mess. It's a mess. And in my humble opinion, Chanel deserves a virgin. <laughs> no. Now, Virginie has virgin in her name, but they need a virgin. A little bit like Balma did when they hired um, Olivier Roustig. Chanel needs fresh blood. Chanel doesn't need a washed up, used up condom from another person. You know what I'm saying? In my humble opinion. In my humble opinion. But where is Virginie going now? David is asking, so is Virginie going to Dior? I don't know if Virginie is going to Dior or if Virginie is just retiring. She has, she's old enough to retire and just chill if she wanted to. I don't know if she will retire. I don't know what she's planning to do next. We, we do not know. But so what is Chanel planning to do? I mean, if they're, if they're going to sell the company, this is not the time to change designer. You first sell the company. Uh, then you then, then you change the designer. Not before, because changing the designer before is very disruptive to, to the price of your company. Very tricky. Now, as to what has transpired in the recent past, thumb up this video while we talk about this. What has transpired in the recent past here? Hedy Sliman. Hedy Sliman has had his beef with LVMH, and he brought a lot to Celine. Uh, you know, trendy bags, dabbled a little bit into couture, the haute couture, not really haute couture, but there was handmade couture at Celine. Men and women. Hedy is complicated. Hedy Sliman was a favorite of Karl Lagerfeld. Does Chanel still want to listen to Karl Lagerfeld, though, from his grave? Do they still want to follow his tips and instructions all these years after his passing? Times have changed drastically. Economy has changed drastically. Would even Carl himself think the same stuff he thought five years ago today? Probably not. But Carl was obsessed with Hedy Sliman. Carl also said he lost a ton of weight back in the early 2000s just to be able to fit into Hedy Sliman's Dior Homme because Hedy Sliman was back then uh, the, uh, creative director of Dior Homme, to fit into his skinny look. But then Carl had a falling out, allegedly, with Hedy Sliman. So he was like, mm, would not go, would not go. Carl was stating at a certain point that he could see Hedy Sliman as a continuation of, at Chanel after he's gone. But then again, Carl, somewhere in the 90s, allegedly also said that Jeremy Scott would be a great continuation after him. Of course, he said that when Jeremy was at the top of his prime, young designer, making it in Paris. He was the talk of the town. Now, Jeremy, as much as I love him, he's a little bit washed out on that level. Not necessarily Chanel material at the moment because times are not asking for flamboyance. Times are not asking for crazy looks. Yes, Schiaparelli and uh, Dingleberry, <laughs> Daniel Dingle Blubberberry uh, is de delivering flamboyance, but in a terrible way, in my humble opinion. So to me, that's a flop. So then he changed his mind, Jeremy no more. Then it was Hedy Sliman, but then he had a falling out allegedly with Hedy, stopped buying Dior stuff, right? And so Hedy was no longer on the list. Then he was talking about Heider Ackerman. But Heider Ackerman is now designing for some other brand, and he just got a deal. So I don't think he can just leave his contract to go to Chanel. So he's off the table. Hedy is still in the game because Hedy doesn't have a job, allegedly, anymore. Who else? 
People have been mentioning, oh, John Galliano, John Galliano. I don't think John Galliano is going to leave Marta Margiela anytime soon, because especially now after his latest collection was such a huge success in the gutters, the gutters of Paris and, and the time travel. Uh, yes, Heider Ackermann is at Canada Goose now, right. So, uh, John Galliano, for three reasons, I don't see him coming to Chanel. First reason, he is uh, really, really hitting his str stride right now at Marta Margiela. He is the top of his game. Everybody wants that latest Haute Couture Margiela collection. He's not leaving anytime soon. Second reason, he the racial slurs that he made, uh, you know, at La Perle bar in Paris. Yes, he has apologized. Yes, he went to rehab. Still, the CEOs at Chanel, given the controversies and the gossip that surrounds Coco and the second, you know, world situation and the Germans, to have somebody come to work at Chanel who has stated really nasty things in the past, not a good image. Also, the two owners of Chanel are Jewish. So I don't see John Galliano really, you know, coming to Chanel. It's not going to happen, you guys. John is not going to happen. Um, then, who else? Pierpaolo. Pierpaolo Piccioli, who just left Valentino. He's a candidate, right? Pierpaolo left Valentino. But here's the twist. Pierpaolo is Italian and similar to Riccardo Tisci, who in my humble opinion destroyed Givenchy, I do believe that people at Chanel watched what happened to Givenchy under Riccardo Tisci. And Pierpaolo, Pierpaolo is definitely light years, in my humble opinion, more elegant than Riccardo Tisci. Riccardo Tisci for me is a burino. If you know, you know. It just it does, really what he touches turns to Rottweiler T-shirts. <laughs> like absolutely no. Uh, Pierpaolo is a little bit risky for Chanel. Uh, Pierpaolo is way more elegant than Tisci, but Pierpaolo is very Italian, and he did a great job at an Italian maison like Valentino. I don't see him at a Frenchman. I, I don't see Pierpaolo doing Chanel. I don't. Then we have these kind of, this intel, right, that Lina Nair keeps saying, you know, it's really important that women are guiding the brand of Chanel because the legacy of Chanel is with Coco Chanel, who was also a woman. So between the lines, what we read there is that Lina Nair wants a woman to direct Chanel fashion. We have a man directing Chanel perfumes, uh, Olivier Polge, the son of Jacques Polge, nepotism at its finest. <laughs> he took over after his dad was done at Chanel. So we have a man doing perfumes, but we have three women doing makeup, the Comet Collective. And we have Virginie Via doing fashion. Now, Virginie Via is leaving. So if we are to read between the lines and understand that maybe Lina Nair is hinting had another woman coming to Chanel, then who might that woman be? And yes, you guys are right in the chats. A lot of people are saying, is it Sarah? Is it going to be Sarah who just left um, McQueen? Well, we got to look at the numbers, you see. Um, you know, because Sarah, Sarah Bur Burton... Or, or Barton, I think it's Burton, you pronounce it, Sarah Burton. Um, the, the problem is she was not doing a great job money-wise at McQueen, which is one of the reasons I believe she left or was let go. And Lena Nair, in every interview she talks about, I know how to bring home the bacon. I know how to make money. I know how to... All she talks about is money. She doesn't talk really about the art, the refined taste of haute couture and prêt-à-porter. I don't even know if she knows the difference between the two because she keeps claiming that her prêt-à-porter jackets were handmade. Anyway, Lina Nair is a, is a whole other can of worms, but uh, on its own, in its own right. Uh, 
so if she's all about the money and she in every review she gives, she keeps repeating the money. It's so vulgar. <laughs> but anyway, if she's all about the money, then Sarah Burton is not the choice she would go with because Sarah Burton did not bring money to Alexander McQueen. So I think Sarah is out of the game. Nancy says, but talking about money is tacky. I'd rather them only talk about quality. I agree with you. Paparazzi Team Bryce says Phoebe Philo. Phoebe Philo was just very committed to launching her own brand. And again, also another Celine, ex Celine moment, right? Hedy Sliman being also ex Celine. Maybe. But Phoebe Philo is a little bit too dry and too close to the vision that maybe Virginie Via had. I think if if Chanel are going to have a new artistic direction, they need to change direction. They need to change something. They can't just keep it a status quo, right? Who else I have on my list here? Do you guys remember a couple of... And this is... And you guys, and we're getting to... Well, first, let me talk about Tom Ford. Tom Ford retired. Tom Ford left his own brand. Is Tom Ford going to come back from retirement? Is he going to unretire and become the artistic director of Chanel? Possibly. This is a possibility. Believe it or not, this is a possibility. Uh, would it be good for Chanel? In a way, I could see it work. I could see it work for Chanel in a very interesting way. Uh, he would make Chanel sexy again. <laughs> However, Chanel was never about sexy. So he might miss the mark there. Coco Chanel was never about the sexy Gucci era of Tom Ford. Coco Chanel was very, very different. Very, very different. So Tom Ford could handle Chanel and could handle the scope and the size of producing for such a huge company. He could handle that. But is he ready to step out of retirement to do 10 collections a year? Every, I mean, it's exhausting. Plus, probably his cachet would be very, very high. Another name, Mark Jacobs. Now, Mark Jacobs, had they hired Mark Jacobs five years ago when Carl was gone, I would have said perfect choice. I would have said perfect choice. But as of late, Mark Jacobs has been very, very mm, loosey-goosey. I love him to bits, don't get me wrong. I love a creative, quirky person, but he seems to be losing a little bit. <laughs> I don't know if it's substances that he himself has stated in some videos that he allegedly has been over been overindulged sometimes in, allegedly. So in his interviews, he appears a little bit unstable to me. And uh, if you're going to take over Chanel, you need to be focused. And I'm talking sharp as a razor blade. Uh, you cannot be rehab chic. You can't. As a client of Chanel, you can you know, Karl Lagerfeld loved Lindsay Lohan. They were huge friends, actually, you know. Karl and Lindsay, two peas in a pot. But Lindsay did not design for Chanel, you see. Mark is a little bit, has become a little bit too unstable for me. I, I, uh, allegedly, of course, I'm, I'm thinking, I don't know if he's capable. Plus, you know, the whole look and the vibe he's going for right now is not really Chanel because the huge fingernails he's doing, which is really fun and creative. But think about it. If he were hired by Chanel to take over after Virginie, they would have already been in talks with him at least a year ago. At least a year ago. And had they been in talks with him about this at least a year ago, had he known already since a year, he would not have done the long nails, the... The whole aesthetic he's been going through, the the Balenciaga slippers, all, his whole style is showing me that he has no contact with Chanel. Yes, he's wearing Chanel jackets often. He's been wearing them also during Carl's era, though. 
so I think Marc Jacobs is not on the list. And here we get to the most dramatic of options. Uh, and this was said to me a couple of weeks ago from French fashion intel. And if you watch me and you follow me, you know. And Alisa just guessed it in the chats, Jacques Mousse. I, I mean, and Jacques Mousse, again, another protege of uh, Karl Lagerfeld, believe it or not. Karl discovered him, gave him a chance. You know, Carl, I think Karl, I, I can only speculate here because Karl is no longer with us. I think Karl had the hots for Mr. Full-Blown Body Carpet, Jacques Mousse. And I guess he just liked the... Hmm. I don't even want to say it. I guess he just liked the way the, the boy looked. Okay, let's just put it that way. And uh, so this is how Jacques Mousse was able to enter the fashion scene, to build up his brand. It's all thanks to Carl, really, who opened the doors for him. So I wonder if Chanel is still, the brand is still following Carl's lead and if they are now going to... Yeah, Kev, Carl maybe liked his Mousse. <laughs> Allegedly. You see, and, and this is what I think is going to happen. If Chanel does not hire an internal team, like a commit collective of fashion, could be interesting. They could have one. Look, this is how I would do it. You have one team that's dedicated to creating the Whimsical Cruise Collection. You have one artistic team just doing cruise and métier d'art. And then you have just one team doing haute couture. And then you have one team doing prêt-à-porter. And these teams are dedicated constantly just to those collections. That would make totally sense to me because then you would have people that have enough time to dedicate time to said collections. Instead of one person having to do 10 collections a year, they're going to go crazy. There's no way you can keep doing, having a fresh perspective on the world, having a fresh perspective on creativity and delivering 10 collections a year while staying fresh. Forget about it. Like I said, Virginie was there five years and did round about 50 collections in just five years. It's insane. No normal person can survive that. So I'm thinking a group collective to design designated would be interesting. However, the difficult part there is the cohesion might, might be lacking. And then you might have fans. You might have a fan of the designer designing the cruise collection. So you only buy cruise. And then you're going to have another person who likes the designer just of the Prêt-à-Porter and they're only going to buy Prêt-à-Porter. So that might be disruptive to Lina Nair's vision of money because then she's going to be more unstable in terms of how do the boutiques order their collections? Because some clients don't buy Prêt-à-Porter regular spring, summer, fall, winter because they buy just cruise. So that would be a little bit disruptive. A little bit disruptive. Uh, so again, we're back to the one designer that's probably going to get the job. And then that one designer is going to overlook the teams designing separate collections which is also what Virginie did. You know, of course she had her teams to also work. But rumor has it that it's going to be Jacques Mousse. And if it is Jacques Mousse, I mean, never say never because I'm always a victim of Chanel and I always end up buying their stuff. But like if it is Jacques Mousse, I'm, I'm done, you know, with their fashion. And Shop Queen says, I vote Jacob. He knows everything about the brand, brings them so much advertising. They owe it to him. Put Jacob on the payroll for real. Thank you, Shop Queen. And I have, coincidentally, quite a few ideas in which direction I would take uh, the fashion um, sphere of Chanel. Like I have 
a very clear vision and a very, very, very clear perspective of how Coco Chanel's legacy would be maintained. Her memory would burn like a clear flame, always the memory there, while at the same time going into the future. You know, um, Jacques Mousse, you, you better call me if you want to make that bacon for Lena Nair, honey. <laughs> Not that I would want to collaborate with him, but anyway. So this is the sad point we're at. Thinking, you know, when Virginie first took over at Chanel, thumb up the video, by the way, it means the world to me. And I'm really trying hard to get to 100K subbies. Uh, it's moving slow. But let's try to do it. We're delivering here, you know, a lot of work, a lot of love, blood, sweat, and tears coming into every every video I make. So thank you guys so much for considering subscribing and thumbing up the video. The amount of um, kind of lack of direction that Virginie had at the beginning, beginning in 2019, and we were thinking, oh, it would be so exciting if she leaves and somebody else comes. Uh, now we're at a point where we are dreading who is coming after her. That's not a good sign. That's not a good sign for the world of fashion, and it's not a good sign for Chanel either. The direction they're going towards is not so good. Pink Hornet says Zach Posen would be an excellent choice. For who, Pink? For H&M? Maybe. <laughs> oh, Michael says Zach Posen is at Gap currently. Yeah. Suits him right. <laughs> Indrani says, here, another vote for Dacob. Thank you, sweetie. Very kind. But of course, Chanel would never come to me. They might come for me, but not to me because I'm very vocal and they like it. Hush, hush. They like stuff to be invisible. Best is if you don't even have social media, if you're working for them. They do not like it at all. Um, so the sad state of affairs, it's probably going to be Jacques Mousse, you guys. You know, if it were two years ago, we could have thought, oh, maybe it's going to be Alessandro Michele, but Alessandro Michele now has his new job, so that's done. That's that's that. I don't know if Maria Grazia Curie is going to leave Dior. Maybe Maria Grazia... I don't see Maria Grazia Curie at Chanel. I, I, don't, I don't even see her at Dior, to be honest with you. But Maria Grazia Curie brings the coin with her boring little outfits. That's what sells in these boring times we live in. And that's what Lena Nair, I would think, would love. Money. She might think, oh, Maria Grazia Curie is going to deliver safe, safe stuff for us. Hello, Barbara Rank says, the Olsen twins would make dough and had a very close relationship with Chanel. Oh, to dream. Uh, I disagree. <laughs> the, Ol the Olsen twins at Chanel would not be my choice. Daisy Dior says Olsen's would be a dream. Let the Olsen's flourish and shine at the row. Let them stick to the row. <laughs> they're, they're good there. Michael Ocampo, that's a wonderful idea. Christian Lacroix, I would love to see Christian Lacroix. I mean, he's more or less retired. He did like a collection for Desigual, which, oh my gosh. Any, everyone can make mistakes and everyone needs the coin. But Christian Lacroix for Chanel, oof, now that would be something. Louis says Jean-Paul Gaultier. Jean-Paul Gaultier kind of retired as well. Uh, I don't think Jean-Paul Gaultier wants the stress of having to do 10 collections a year for Chanel. I don't think if Gaultier wanted the stress, Gaultier would be doing his own brand instead of giving somebody else the task to do haute couture every year. I don't see Jean-Paul Gaultier returning to fashion and doing 10 collections a year for Chanel. I mean, he's also, you know, kind of retired at this point. So, no, I don't think Gaultier would do it. Um, Vel says, I'm going to have nightmares about Jacques Mousse at Chanel. Yeah, me too. Me too. You know, it's... Yeah. Corey Kay says, if I had my <clears throat> choice, it would be Tom Ford. Uh, so there you have Some people are making fun of it, saying Donatella Versace. Of course, it's just a joke. No, obviously not. Donatella would not fit Chanel at all. Uh, 
that's that. It's e it's either gonna be Jacques Mousse or some commit collective, two or three, three or four designers together, or somebody that's like rising from just like Alessandro Michele, like nobody knew them. They were working for Chanel in the background, in the design team, and now they are going to get the job as, as the artistic directors, which to be honest with you, I would prefer rather than taking some famous person because I, that would be an innovation. That would be like Chanel making a statement saying, we are investing in the future. We are investing in young designers. We believe in them. We want to give them a platform. That would be fabulous. I would applaud that from Chanel. I would applaud that from Chanel. You know, there you go. Maya Little Love says, Super D, you would be the per you'd be perfect for Chanel. Not only you'd roast a pig, but bring the bacon for show. Everyone would love your design. I can just, oh, thank you. Thank you so much, sweetie. Thank you. Thank you. And I would always like, like to balance out Chanel for the extroverts for the people that love the quirky side of Chanel, but then also the more somber pieces, the more subdued, demure pieces for the, for the people that love the more silent collection. Because Coco, that's exactly what she did. She did the loud pieces, the flamboyant pieces, but she also did, did the very, very, very subdued classic pieces. And to balance those out, that's the magic of Chanel, in my opinion. That would be my vision for Chanel. Always that beautiful, elegant balance of crazy and sober all the time. You know, balancing that, allowing everybody to have a voice uh, in, in every chapter, of, in every new chapter of Chanel from the class. Mind you, Xavier says, I love the classic. What is classic, though? Because Chanel's classic, Coco's classic, is also whimsy. She was whimsical since the 20s, okay, into the 30s and so on, from costume jewelry also to clothing. Whimsy is, is also a classic Chanel trait. Don't ever forget that. Classic Chanel is, just, is not just what many of us are used to seeing, the ensemble, the jacket with the four pockets, and the skirt that covers the knee. Yes, that's one specific look of Coco Chanel, but that's not the only classic look of Coco Chanel. We must never forget that. You know, we must never forget that. Um, so there you have it. Let me know in the comments. <laughs> Somebody said Kanye West for Chanel. Yeah, N not even Adidas wants him back at this point. So I, I don't think that Chanel would take a chance with somebody so unstable, allegedly, you know what I mean, to, to take over 10 collections a year. Absolutely not going to happen, in my opinion, not going to happen. Um, so let me know down below what your thoughts are. Who do you think is going to come next at Chanel? And do you agree with me or not? Either way, what we are left with now is this brand new perfume that has just been launched. Well, the perfume isn't new. The bottle is new. And our little commit. <laughs> so there is something good coming out from Chanel still. There you have it, guys. Until next time, thumb up this video, subscribe to my channel if you've enjoyed it, and never forget to never give up on love. Bye.